First, I'm going to tackle some of the issues which could be faced when culturing feeder-dependent induced pluripotent stem cells, or iPSCs. But before I dive into that, I want to highlight what we at CGAP class as healthy feeder-dependent iPSCs. iPSCs like to grow in highly compacted colonies, as can be seen in these two images. These colonies should have nice, smooth edges. And if you zoom in, you can see the individual cells have a high nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio. The arrows in this image indicate just some of the nuclei in this colony. When compacted like this, it should be difficult to identify cell-to-cell -cell boundaries. Some general points regarding feeder-dependent iPSCs. Typically, colonies are ready to passage every five to seven days. When passaging, it is important to not dissociate to single cells. Stem cells like to grow in colonies and single cells can spontaneously differentiate or die. Feeder-dependent passage methods are very subjective and require practice to ensure you are seeding the correct fragment size and at the correct density. Stem cells, by their very nature, are sensitive and will readily differentiate. They require daily media change and screening. Optimal quality of reagents is essential, especially that of the feeder layer, and I'll touch upon that in a minute. With regards to the reagents, Make sure they are in date, are correctly stored, have not gone through too many thermal cyclings, or have been left out for extended periods of time. Remember, FGF has a short half-life of approximately 6 hours at 37 degrees centigrade. Also check that all light-sensitive reagents have not been left out. It is essential to remember any changes in the culture conditions is a stress to the cells that can result in differentiation. At CGAP, we batch test certain reagents such as KOSR and keep a maintenance plate if we make any changes to the culture system. We also strongly recommend you make frozen vial backups as soon as possible. When differentiation starts, it is often easier to thaw a vial than it is to rescue what is in culture. If a line persistently has issues over numerous passages, we recommend you check the carrier type. Let's investigate the feeder layer. The feeder layer provides a surface for the iPSCs to attach and releases essential factors which the iPSCs need to grow and to not differentiate. At CGAP, we use commercially available irradiated mouse embryonic fibroblasts, or MEFs. Before seeding iPSCs, it is essential that the feeder layer is of good quality, meaning the cells are evenly spread at the correct confluence of around 70% and with a uniform morphology which is showing no signs of stress. Let's look at some images. Here is an example of two sparse of feeder layer. You want to aim for a confluency more like this. Anything more than in this image is too dense. Also, make sure you are agitating your plates correctly. We'll show a video of how we do this later in the presentation. Otherwise, like in this image, you will have too high a density in the centre of the well, as highlighted in red, and too low a density as you move to the outer edges. Now let's look at the health of the cells. Here you can see MEF cells have become elongated and spindle-like. You do not want to seed onto these cells. However, after changing to stem cell media, the morphology of the MEF cells may change to resemble this. You also want to check there isn't a high level of apoptosis occurring as seen in this image. Let's start troubleshooting potential issues with feeder-dependent iPSCs. Low recovery post-thaw. Feeder-dependent iPSCs take approximately two weeks to recover. During this time, it is essential to screen the edges of the well as this is where colonies can often appear. Don't panic if you still see colonies floating 24 hours post-thaw. This is to be expected and is why we top up as opposed to media change to give time for as much attachment as possible of the fragments. To ensure optimal freezing and thawing, ensure cells are in a log phase of growth by making sure colonies are of a reasonable size and are nicely compacted. Also, check confluence across the dish is 70 to 80% so 60 to 90% should be fine. 
when thawing, transport vials on dry ice and thaw rapidly in a 37 degree centigrade water bath. We have tried using a dry water bath, but we found it affected viability. Check you remembered to add 10 micromolar of rock inhibitor at thaw and top up. At freezing and thawing, be careful not to dissociate to single cells and make sure the health of your MEFs is adequate. If health drastically deteriorates over the two weeks, you can consider topping up the feeder layer. Issues with recovery post passage. We do not expect to see 100% attachment, but by 24 hours, you should see attachment of the correct size colonies as indicated in this image and the floating fragments are removed with the media change. If you see very few colonies per well, it is worth remembering that a line can be recovered from one colony. However, if after approximately four passages, you still only have a handful of colonies, you might want to readdress the colony size and seeding density at passage. If you witness high levels of cell death, investigate the quality of your reagents. It is rare we have witnessed this, but when it has happened, it is because we have used out-of-date media or FGF has not been added. Alternatively, if there is a lack of proliferation, make sure you are maintaining cells in log phase by not seeding too low or regularly dissociating to single cells or repeatedly allowing colonies to overgrow. At all times, check the health of your MEFs and quality of your reagents. If you notice non-uniform distribution of colonies, such as congregation in the centre of the well, this could be due to swirling your plates. Here's how we agitate our plates. If you see an increase of colonies to one side of the plate, ensure incubator and shelves are level. If you see concentric circles forming, Check for vibrations, which could be caused by incubators being in close proximity or on the same bench as equipment such as centrifuges or microbiological safety cabinets. If you have uneven or bare patches, check the distribution of your feeder layer is even. An issue with the feeder dependent layer is you can struggle to remove the colonies from the dish. Typically, a 45 minute incubation in collagenase and dispase should be enough. This can be extended to one hour. Any longer than this and you run the risk of generating single cells. Lack of detachment can be caused by colonies becoming too large and dense, as shown in this image, or a confluency exceeding 90%, or if there are any issues with your enzyme, such as being out of date or having gone through too many thermal cycles. If a one hour incubation doesn't work, you can gently replace your collagenase and dispase with media and try again with fresh enzymes or manually passage some of your colonies. When colony picking or manually passaging, use a 20 or 200 microliter tip on the end of a pipette or two mil stripette to manually cut your colony into reasonable size fragments before pipetting and transferring into a new dish. Feeder dependent colonies can often present with overgrown centers. This appears as darkened centers which grow vertically and can often detach leaving what we call donut colonies. This should be avoided as it can lead to differentiation. To avoid this, make sure your colony sizes at passage are not too big, as highlighted in this image. Ensure the feeder layer isn't too dense. And when discoloration starts, passage, even if confluence isn't high. As long as there are enough reasonable sized colonies, you should be fine. In some labs, though never in CGAP, people manually remove the overgrown centres before passage. One of the biggest issues faced when working with IPSCs is spontaneous differentiation. You need to look out for colonies no longer having smooth edges, colonies becoming less compact, individual cells becoming larger, a general morphology change in the individual cells. Here are some examples of what we typically witness. What stress triggers it is not always clear, and dealing with it is never straightforward. In a bid to avoid it, make sure your feeder layer is optimal. Do not allow your plate to become too cold. Warm reagents to between room temperature and 37 degrees centigrade before use, and ensure they are in date and have been correctly stored. Make sure fragment size and seeding density are optimal. Do not allow colonies to overgrow.
Remember, any changes in culture conditions are a stress to the cells. If differentiation occurs, sometimes basic passaging is enough, especially if you passage early before the differentiation overtakes the iPSCs. Be gentle post-enzyme incubation in an attempt to only take large colonies, leaving behind single cells. Alternatively, you could try manually passaging any healthy colonies, taking care to clean any differentiated cells away from the colonies you are picking. Next, I'm going to tackle some of the issues which could be faced when culturing feeder-free induced pluripotent stem cells, or iPSCs. But before I dive into that, I want to highlight what we at CGAP class as healthy feeder-free iPSCs. iPSCs like to grow in highly compacted colonies, as can be seen in these two images. These colonies should have nice, smooth edges. And if you zoom in, you can see the individual cells have a high nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio. The arrows in the image indicate just some of the nuclei in this colony. When compacted like this, it should be difficult to identify cell-to-cell -cell boundaries. Some slight differences to feeder-dependent iPSCs is feeder-free colonies take slightly longer to compact and colonies can spread more easily, meaning colonies often merge without resulting in overgrowth. Some general points regarding feeder-free iPSCs. Typically, colonies are ready to passage every four to six days. When passaging, it is important to not dissociate to single cells. Stem cells like to grow as colonies and single cells can spontaneously differentiate or die. Feeder-free cultures can handle slightly higher split ratios than feeder dependents. Typically, we use a one in six, but a one in eight and a one in 10 should still be tolerated dependent on the cell line. Stem cells by their very nature are sensitive and will readily differentiate. They require daily media change and screening. Optimal quality reagents is essential. Make sure they are in date, are stored correctly, have not gone through too many thermal cyclings or have been left out for extended periods of time. Remember, FGF has a short half-life of approximately six hours at 37 degrees centigrade. Also check that any light sensitive reagents have not been left out. It is essential to remember any changes in the culture conditions is a stress to the cells and can result in differentiation. At CGAP, we keep a maintenance plate if we make any changes to the culture system. We also strongly recommend you make frozen vial backups as soon as possible. When differentiation starts, it is often easier to thaw a vial than it is to rescue what is in culture. If a line persistently has issues over numerous passages, we recommend you check the carrier type. Let's start troubleshooting potential issues with feeder-free iPSCs. Low recovery post-thaw. Feeder-free iPSCs take approximately four to seven days to recover. During this time, make sure you screen the edges of the well, but with feeder-free, you should expect to obtain a reasonable confluence across the well post-thaw. Don't panic if you still see colonies floating 24 hours post-thaw. This is to be expected, and usually plenty of colonies will have attached within this time. If after thaw, colonies do not appear to be compacting, as in this image, this is relatively common. Take care when passaging, so not to dissociate to single cells, and after one passage, colonies should start to compact as normal. To ensure optimal freezing and thawing, ensure cells are in log phase by making sure colonies are of a reasonable size and nicely compacted. Also check confluence across the dish is 70 to 80%, though 60 to 90% should be fine. When thawing, transport vials on dry ice and thaw rapidly in a 37 degree centigrade water bath. We have tried using dry water baths, but we found it affected viability. Check you remembered to add 10 micromolar rock inhibitor at thaw. At freezing and thawing, be careful not to dissociate to single cells. Issues with recovery post-passage. We do not expect to see 100% attachment and most of what is in suspension is single cells. But by 24 hours, you should see attachment of the correct size colonies as indicated in this image and the floating fragments are removed with the media change. 
If you see very few colonies pair well, it is worth remembering that a line can be recovered from only one colony. However, if after two or three passages, you still only have a handful of colonies, you might want to readdress colony size and seeding density at passage. If you witness high levels of cell death, investigate the quality of the reagents. It is rare we have witnessed this, but when it has happened, it is due to out-of-date media. We also found that if we stored our vitronectin at minus 20 degrees centigrade, when colonies became compacted, the cells dissociated and came off the dish. When we went back to storing the vitronectin at minus 80 degrees centigrade, this stopped. Alternatively, if you see a lack of proliferation, make sure you are maintaining your cells in log phase of growth. By not using too high a split ratio, regularly dissociating to single cells, or repeatedly allowing colonies to overgrow. At all times, check the quality of your reagents. If you notice non-uniform distribution of colonies, such as congregation in the center of the well, this could be due to swirling your plates. Here's how we agitate our plates. If you see an increase in colonies to one side of the plate, ensure incubator and shelves are level. If you see concentric circles forming, check for vibrations which could be caused by incubators being in close proximity or on the same bench as equipment such as centrifuges or microbiological safety cabinets. If you have uneven or bare patches, check you have full coverage of your vitronectin. If plates have not been properly agitated, you can have dry spots as seen in this image. In some cases, it can be difficult to remove the colonies from the dish. Typically, a four to six minute incubation in EDTA at room temperature should be enough. This can be extended to eight minutes at room temperature, any longer than this, and you run the risk of generating single cells. Lack of detachment can be caused by colonies becoming too large and dense, or if confluency exceeds 90%. What you often witness when confluency becomes too high is media becomes very acidic, causing the colonies to dissociate slightly and the edges of the colonies to become spiky, all of which can be seen in this image and should be avoided. Other possible explanations are the wrong concentration of EDTA being used, or the stock EDTA has precipitated out of solution, or it has been too long between passages, though the vitronectin will start to degrade after seven days and it is not wise to leave cells on the dish past this point. Solutions may be to gently wash the dish and add fresh EDTA, or manually passage some of your colonies. When colony picking or manually passaging, use a 20 or 200 microliter tip on the end of a pipette or two mil strapette to manually cut your colony into reasonable sized fragments before pipetting and transferring into a new dish. Overgrowth in the center of colonies is rare as feeder-free cells seem to spread more easily than feeder-dependent, but it can still occur. This appears as darkened areas which grow vertically and can often detach, leaving what we call donut colonies. This should be avoided as it can lead to differentiation. To avoid this, make sure your colony sizes at passage are not too big, as highlighted in this image. You want to aim for this size and density. When discoloration starts, passage. Even if confluence isn't high, as long as there are enough reasonable sized colonies, you should be fine. In some labs, though never in CGAP, people manually remove the overgrown centers before passage. One of the biggest issues faced when working with IPSCs is spontaneous differentiation. You need to look out for colonies no longer having smooth edges, colonies becoming less compact, individual cells becoming larger, a general morphology change in the individual cells. Here are some examples of what we typically witness. As you can see, there is quite a lot of variability in the types of differentiation in feeder-free cultures. But as there are no feeders present, you can often spot early signs of differentiation. What stress triggers it is not always clear, and dealing with it is never straightforward. In a bid to avoid it, don't allow your plates to get too cold. Warm reagents to between room temperature and 37 degrees centigrade before use and ensure they are in date and have been stored correctly. Make sure fragment size and seeding density are optimal. Do not allow colonies to overgrow. 
Remember, any changes in the culture conditions are a stress to the cells. If differentiation occurs, sometimes basic passage is enough, especially if changing culture systems, it is best to perform normal passage for approximately four passages to give time for acclimatization. In my team, there are two conflicting arguments as to how to tackle it. Some believe it is best to passage early before differentiation becomes too great. Others wait until the iPSCs have become slightly more confluent than normal, compacting the differentiated cells and resulting in you taking more iPSCs than differentiated cells into your next culture. Neither theories are proven, and I believe it is ultimately easier to go back to a frozen vial than trying to rescue what is in culture. Other ideas are to be gentle post-EDTA incubation in an attempt to only take large colonies, leaving behind single cells. We also recommend you look at what has come off the dish post-washing your colonies off. On some occasions, we notice that differentiated cells have dislodged, leaving behind healthy iPSCs. You could then rewash your plate and use this suspension to passage on. Alternatively, you could try manually passaging any healthy colonies, taking care to clean any differentiated cells away from the colonies you are picking. Or manually clean the differentiation off the dish prior to passaging. Manually cleaning your dish. When differentiation forms around healthy colonies, you can attempt to manually clean the plates using a 20 or 200 microliter sterile tip on the end of either a pipette or a 2 mil stripette. And using an inverted microscope located in the hood, we carefully clean round the colonies. If you do not have a microscope in your hood, you can mark the location of healthy colonies on the base of your dish using an inverted microscope before returning to the hood and scraping around the pen marks. This is the end of the video. For any queries about cell line availability, ordering or purchasing lines, email culturecollections.technical at phe.gov.uk or if you have any general inquiries, email hipski at ebi.ac.uk.